Okay, I hope this is audible. Okay, okay. I'll be moderating. Okay. Is the mic on? Raphael? Is the mic on? Still nothing? What do you mean, test the microphone? Like, just the microphone on the side. No, it should, it. yeah. So, I mean, if it's on, it's going to be audible all around. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, it's not like a, a mic pickup, it's not picking up or projecting. Test it. Test now, test, test. Test. Keep talking, he says. You can hear me now? Okay. Okay, keep talking. I got it. Okay. How do you turn up the volume? It's probably up that size. I can hear my own voice now. Okay, well, the guy giving me directions from up there has disappeared, so I guess we're ready to go. It's good? Okay, well, I can hear myself, so I'm sure you can too. Okay. So after the planetarium show where we just traveled from the center of our galaxy to the edge and back again faster than the speed of light, I can't decide whether we are now younger and my twin brother is much older or, <laughs> or whether we went back in time. So anyway, yeah, something like that. Okay. Oh, it's okay. Good. Okay. So we're going to spare you the commercial we usually have at this point from our merch manager because she's asked not to have her name mentioned. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go directly to the one business thing that we have before our speaker, and that is uh, Chuck will run through our um, outreach for the coming month. Are you waving your hands because Chuck isn't here? <laughs> He's here. I saw him earlier. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll hear about that later. So, okay, that's not him. So we'll move right along. Yeah, I didn't know there were more people. 
So I was once at a, at a concert, a piano or a guitar recital at McCabe's Guitar Shop in Santa Monica. And during the performance, someone's guitar string broke and the male, female vocal had a precisely timed joke that she used to stall the audience while they, they replaced the guitar string. And she advertised it as the worst joke ever told. And it was, as you can tell, a shaggy dog story. And I may tell it to you someday. <laughs> but it is genuinely the worst joke ever told. But it's very precisely timed. But we're not going to wait for Chuck that long. Well, I'm yeah, I'm going to introduce you right now. So we'll have our vice president, the Baron Ron Heron, stand up and give his introduction for tonight's speaker. <laughs> Mr. President, that is uh, one of the greatest presidents in the world, I've always thought. I would vote for him, maybe over Biden. Maybe, oh, but, uh, thanks. <laughs> See, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere through that joke. No. Chuck? Uh, let me grab Might want to give some names. You're Jerry Wilson, the president. Uh, right. This is our merchandise, our, uh, merchandise manager's husband. Oh, yeah. Outreach, <laughs> Outreach, yeah. Chuck McCartland. Okay, thanks, Jerry. All right, just, just hand it over to him when you're done. Okay, you got it. All right, things are picking up. Uh, May is kind of the the end of any kind of school outreach we'll be doing, and then uh, June, July, August, and September we're booked every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we're going to need outreaches. Anyway, uh, coming up. Um, on Thursday, El Camino School is their science night, uh, five to nine, so it's not gonna be dark. Um, but I figure we'll go there with some meteorites and hit them with that. And then on uh, second, yeah, second Saturday, uh, as usual, is here at the Museum of Natural History where, with our star party over by, uh, by Palmer Observatory. So starting at 8.30, when it's starting to get dark. And then on uh, Tuesday the 16th, starting at nine in the morning, it's a solar observation for, um, AP students in physics from uh, Santa Barbara High School. So that's nine to 12. So folks with hydrogen alpha or white light uh, filters for the sun are welcome. And then on Thursday, uh, the 18th, we're at Bacara Hotel from uh, for starting at eight o'clock uh, on the, um, the um, bluff lawn next to the Angel Oak uh, restaurant. And then third Friday of every month, as usual, it's the Westmont Public Telescope Night there uh, at their big uh, observatory. And then uh, this is a new one. This one did not make it to our webpage, but uh, on the 20th, Saturday the 20th, starting set up at 8 p.m. is um, basically a star party for Los Olivos um, at uh, St. Mark's Church there on their front lawn. And then on Tuesday the 23rd, fourth Tuesday of the month, as usual, is Telescope Tuesday out at Camino Real Marketplace starting at 7 o'clock because we got the moon to look at. And then Thursday, the 25th is Hope School Moon Night, uh, set up at eight o'clock. And then on Saturday, the 27th is Las Flores Ranch Park up in Santa Maria. That's a nice dark spot. And they're having a star party starting at 8.30. So set up at around 7.30. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody. And I think that's it. Here's our speaker, or here's Ron, here's Ron. <laughs> Good job. Most awesome outreach guy you'd ever want to send you an email canceling a Thursday night as he did here. Something about the weather here. Incidentally, just I, I want to take a moment and find out how many of you are new, never been here before. Raise your hand if you saw that awesome amount of publicity we got. This is our second um, first Friday of the month that that's happened. We had 85 last month and it's seating for 80. So there were five on the sidelines. John Palminteri said he would show up or his girlfriend told me that you'd bring him here, but I think he was on television just a few minutes ago. Incidentally, a pandemic's over, but if you want to wear these things and you're old like I am, it hides that rooster craw in your chin. Just... <laughs> and you may know my next guest, uh, speaker. I, I'm trying to, I've lost my notes, so I'm just ad-libbing this and I'll get into it as fast as I can. Robert Andalucci, Andalucci, Sky 
Oh, Ski. Yeah, yeah. Ski. Yeah. Ski. What did I call him? Sky? Well, it's, it's going to be Sky in here, but he's a skier. <laughs> he's one of the UCSB uh, astronomy professors. Do you have his class? Uh, no, I, uh, but I've, I've talked to him before. Okay. Well, he'll be in here live up here next month on June 4th. And I did get July booked, and I think the August speaker is sitting in this room. We'll maybe find one of you. Could be. <laughs> somebody out there, believe it or not, maybe. We'll see what happens. Uh, this is from memory. I haven't been out there, but we're all going to go at some point to visit LCO. This is LCO night because this man works for LCO, which is Las Cumbres Observatories. And we have the uh, lady in charge of development, director of development, who got in touch with me about Joseph Farah. And we're going to take a trip into the middle of the galaxy. Or last I heard that sucker was a hundred billion suns. Yeah, that is, we oh. told that it was a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say one quick thing before I turn it over to, to uh, her. Remembering when you first read about a black hole is like your first date or your first marriage or first kiss or something. I, I remember exactly when I said, oh my God, it was in a copy of Rolling Stone in the seventies, about 50 years ago imagining coming in on a rocket ship and running the damn thing and suddenly the gauges go crazy and you better get turned around and I said what in the world is that I had no idea we're going to find out tonight ladies and gentlemen welcome her with a big applause for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit you're one to join and here she is this is Sandy Searle Seer Seer Seal Seal I want to put an R in there Uh, need one second to find your bio. <laughs> I had your bio in here. You add with it. It takes so long. No, no, yeah. I was reading it and then I lost it. Do you have that document, your bio, the one you sent them? Can you, can you pull it up? I've got it. Hi, everybody. Um, our director, Dr. Lisa Story Lombardi, was supposed to be here tonight to welcome you, and she is detained. So I am going to tell you a little bit about our observatory, and I'm going to introduce Joseph. I don't have to say his name. I can't put my bio. I'm sorry. Right, hold on. That's it. Okay. And how do I toggle this? Uh, you just hit space bar, and it'll, it'll move forward. Okay. So we are the Las Cumbres Observatory. We are headquartered in Goleta in the industrial park behind Raytheon. Um, we are a full service observatory. We're very small, maybe 30 people here in Goleta and five around the world. Uh, we are consistent, we have scientists, we have administrators, we have technical engineers, we have a software team, and uh, we have graduate students. We are also a telescope factory. We actually build telescopes in Goleta. So any of you who come on a tour, you're gonna to get to see that. Currently, we have 25 telescopes that we operate around the world, roughly 34 degrees north and 34 degrees south in a ring around the world. Um, we have three apertures. We have two telescopes that have two meter mirrors in them. We have, I don't know how many that have one meter mirrors in them. Those are used primarily for science. And then we have a smaller network of 11 uh, 40 centimeter or 16 inch telescopes that are used for our educational outreach and for some science. So our mission statement is to advance the understanding of the world of the universe through science and education with our unique global telescope network. How unique are we? We are the primary follow-up organization for time domain astronomy. Um, time domain astronomy is anything in the sky that changes. If there is something that appears one night that was not there the night before, 
That requires follow-up. We want to know what it is. So our telescopes can be trained on that object very quickly. They can follow it for days, weeks, months, years, if necessary. And we can characterize it for the scientists who need that data. Um, you will be hearing more about this in the news, but as a follow-up facility, we work closely with other observatories. For example, uh, gravitational wave observatories are about to restart an observing run. LIGO, Virgo are the ones you've probably heard of because they've been up and running and they're here in the United States. And Kagura, which I believe is Japanese, and they coordinate their observations and share the data with us. So the most public and well-known discovery that we're known for is characterizing the kilonova that happened in August 2017. Um, this was an event that showed up on the uh, gravitational wave observatories and it had um, an optical counterpart. So we were able to identify it and follow it for several days. We were the only observatory in the world that saw the light intensity actually grow. That's that bump in the beginning of that graph and then decay over days. A change in color also indicates the change in the quality of the light that we were following. And the locations on those Earth show you which of our telescopes were making that observation on that particular day. So as the Earth turns, our telescopes hand off observations to the next set. There's always a telescope in the dark. So other things that we're going to be following, uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to come online sometime next year, I think, has an eight millimeter, eight meter mirror, 3.2 gigapixel camera. I believe it is the largest camera ever built and it's been installed. It's going to survey the entire southern sky um, every other night, I believe. It expects to see millions of changes in the sky per night, millions per night. So this is going to be an unprecedented amount of astronomical data coming to the whole world. And so our software teams, have they want to get ahead of this problem. They have been working on ways to process the information and to get the valuable things to the scientists who need it. And so we will be coordinating with them quite closely. Um, we also do work in-house. We identify exoplanets. Those are planets that are orbiting stars other than our own. We call them exoplanets. And we do a lot of follow-up with the TESS mission, which is a project that belongs to NASA. So that goes on currently. And we have exoplanet scientists on our own staff. And we also have a solar system group that follows near-Earth objects. And again, we do a follow-up for the NEOWISE um, spacecraft um, observatory and ATLAS. And there's going to be a new one going up in 2026. So uh, this is our speaker tonight, Joseph Farah. He's wearing a suit tonight. And, but normally he's in these UCSB t-shirts. He has many, so he always <laughs> looks the same. So I'm going to read this and um, add my own little bits. So uh, you're in for a rare treat tonight because he's the real thing. He's actually done this work himself, so he can talk about it with great depth and expertise. Currently, he is a second year PhD student in astrophysics at UC Santa Barbara. He studies supernovae under the direction of our own Dr. Andy Howell. I'm going to make you stand up. He's in the audience. <laughs> so that is uh, Joseph's doctoral advisor, and he's also adjunct professor. He teaches at UCSB, he teaches astrophysics. Um, Dr. Howell runs the Global Supernova Project, which is headquartered at LCO, and this involves hundreds of scientists around the world who study supernovae and co coordinate their work. Uh, Joseph received his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Massachusetts, Boston in 2021. While he was there, he worked on the Event Horizon Telescope, that's the EHT that you'll be hearing about tonight. He was a Smithsonian Fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics under the supervision of Michael Johnson. He helped produce the very first image of the very first black hole, M87 star, and he led the development of novel techniques for analyzing and measuring the shadows of black holes observed with the EHT. He remains a member of the EHT collaboration and he pioneered a method for dynamically imaging sources such as the Galactic Center on short time scales as part of the effort to image the black hole Sag A star. Sag A star is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. For his work with the collaboration, mind you, he is very young, Joseph was named a Barry M. Goldwater Scholar, 
a co-recipient of the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. The Breakthrough Prize is the one that is funded by all the tech wizards in Silicon Valley that competes with the Nobel Prize. So basically at the age of 22, he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, um, he won it as a co recipient of the ESP collaboration, like I was like individually given to the Right, he's a co winner of a Nobel Prize. We're going to give you that. In 2021, he was awarded by the American Phys Physical Society uh, the Leroy Apker Award, uh, which is also a very big deal. Um, outside of his research, he is a digital artist who does tremendous things uh, with digital art. And for fun, he is a competitive quarter mile drag racer, the man can drive a car. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over what lies within imaging the galactic center. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. It's, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys tonight. Um, thank you, Sandy, for that amazing introduction. And uh, uh, thank you to Ronnie and SBAU and the museum uh, for uh, letting me come here and, and talk to you guys tonight. Hopefully not bore you guys. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Joseph. I'm speaking today on behalf of the uh, LCO and the EHT. And uh, normally I would say something like, uh, today I'd like to tell you about the second image of a black hole. Uh, but I actually have a better idea. Today, I want us all to be black hole hunters. So. Uh, Join me as we leave the museum, and we're going to travel to one of the real EHT telescopes in the array. So say goodbye to the museum. We'll take a quick hop and a skip to the Santa Barbara Airport. Where are we going? We're going to set sail for the Puebla International Airport in the beautiful country of Mexico. And uh, oh, Jesus Christ, that's $700 for a ticket. I don't think I can pay for everyone. Um, is it OK if I just uh, mark you guys as checked luggage? Uh, OK. Uh, so OK, so we're going to fly down to Mexico. We're now in Puebla. And we start on our three hour road trip from Puebla to one of the telescopes in the Event Horizon Telescope Network, which is a beast called the Large Millimeter Telescope or LMT. We're gonna drive past lots of scraggy ass, start scraggy grass and mountains and desert, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was, that was not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna drive past lots of scraggy grass and mountains and desert and some insanely beautiful views on our way to the telescope. I mean, just look at this thing. It absolutely defies logic. That is the largest movable telescope dish in the world. It's over 50 meters in diameter. So it's a little tough to visualize the scale of this thing. So I'm gonna help you out a bit, okay? So here is a picture one of my collaborators took. And that is one of us nerds for scale. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look how, look how big it is. It can probably see us right now looking at it from here. Um, and this is just one of the telescopes in, our, in the EHT. All right, so we're going to go inside. We're going to go inside. We had a long trip. We'd like everything to be working properly for the observation tonight, but we've run into a little problem, which is that our atomic clock is broken. So this machine here inside the telescope is a special type of clock called the hydrogen maser clock. It keeps time for all the telescopes in the array. And it's very, very precise. So while your wristwatch might lose a second every year or so, this bad boy will lose a second once every few million years. They're very expensive too. So for all the uh, atomic clocks in our array, it is over $2 million, 20,000 smackaroos for just this one. Funny story for another time, but I actually almost broke one of these. Uh, it, was in a, it was in a big box. I put my backpack right on it uh, and I got yelled at. Uh, so these things, these things need to stay cold in order to function properly but like really, really cold. But the cooling system in this one is broken, probably because some idiot put their backpack on it while it was in a delicate stage of shipping. So, but what do we do? The observation starts in a few minutes. The nearest engineer who can fix it is a few hours away. So I'll tell you what we do. I'll tell you what we did. In spectacular physicist fashion, we taped a door open to let the clock cool down, leading this, leading to this fantastic quote from a documentary about the image. This piece of tape should hold the door open long enough for the observation to run correctly. If it doesn't, the whole experiment could fail. <laughs> and that really sums up the whole EHT for you. All the careful design, the decades of planning, centuries of physics. And a lot of the success of the project came down to luck and sacrificing an intern to the heathen gods for good clear skies. Um, okay, but you know, once everything is working, the observation can begin, right? The sky darkens, the telescopes come to life, 
And this is what they see, our beautiful galaxy. And they're looking in the constellation Sagittarius at the heart of the Milky Way. And this region is occluded and clouded by the optical thick interstellar dust that lies between us and the center of the galaxy. Now, if you zoom in with radio waves, a whole new world emerges bubbling and broiling with activity as seen as this in this uh, three millimeter image from the Meerkat telescope in South Africa. And if you zoom in even further, a very fascinating sight becomes clear. A set of stars that seem to move in incredibly eccentric and bizarre orbits. Isn't that wild? Like these are stars many times the mass of our sun and they're just flinging around. And if we track them for decades, one thing becomes very clear. These stars were orbiting something massive, powerful, mysterious, and invisible. Ooh. Yes. Gotta share your screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, brief interruption. We're just gonna share a screen. Sorry. Yeah, you do share a screen. Sorry. Okay, cool. Ah. <laughs> okay, there we go. And let's bring that. Oh, you have to hit share that. Yes, we want to oh, yeah, we want to bring it up first yeah, before we do yeah. that. So where is? Uh, well, you can just click on here. If it, if it just pull it up there. Wait, hold on. Oh, you, hold, yeah, on yeah, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The story about me almost breaking an atomic clock is true. I, I did not make that up for giggles. <laughs> I am genuinely not a clever person. <laughs> okay, this should be good. We're also recording this for people on Zoom. It's a Zoom lecture. Um, I guess you're fine. It should be good. Uh, go ahead and move that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I think. I think. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So this thing that is, that all those stars are orbiting is visible to everything except for the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and for some reason, it's not clicking things. There we go. So uh, the EHD is a special global interferometer composed of radio telescopes placed strategically all over the world. And it's tuned specifically to the unique 230 gigahertz, gigahertz radiation that the heated gas outside the black hole flings out. And it can ignore the occluding dust of the interstellar medium and zero in on its target, which is the murky shadow of Sag A star. It's a very special telescope for that reason. I guess that's just gonna play again. Um, okay. So uh, the EHT is a global telescope, and as a consequence, it has a global collaboration running it. So we really are global. We're composed of over 300 members from over 60 institutions in over 20 countries, within, working with an endowment of over $80 million. And you're probably familiar with our most famous result, which is the first image of a black hole, the image of the supermassive black hole in the center of the M87 galaxy, 55 million light years away from Earth. This image is of a black hole that weighs 6 billion times more than our sun. Uh, yeah. uh, so it's really, really cool. But it's actually worth taking a second to um, appreciate something, which is that that image, which by the way is only four by four pixels, costs $80 million. <laughs> and that, you know that's not a great pixel to dollar ratio. <laughs> you can get a black hole image from Dell with much better value. Um, so, but so it's only 16 pixels, but they're 16 very important pixels. And to understand why the image is so special, we need to understand something else that's really extreme about the EHD, which is ridiculous resolution. So when we talk about resolution, we're generally talking about what's the smallest thing you can see. And so for example, the human eye can see things out of, on a scale of about one arc minute. And that's not gonna mean anything to most people. So here's a credit card analogy. If you took a credit card and placed it about a football field away from you, that's about one arc minute. You wouldn't be able to see anything on the card, but you could tell I was holding up, you know, your credit card that I stole from you. Um, that's your that's your average human eye, unaided by you know you know glasses and stuff. But uh, uh, blah blah blah. So that's a human eye. Now, what about home telescopes? Right, that's kind of the next step up. A home telescope like this one that my girlfriend bought me for my birthday um, <laughs> is no, she's great, Eleanor. Uh, so a, a telescope like this one can see about 60 times better than your human eye. So that's the equivalent of me being able to hold up that credit card from where I live in Goleta and you guys being able to see it from where you're sitting right now. And that's just a home telescope. Space telescopes are in a whole other league. So like your home telescope has a resolution of about one arc second. A space telescope like Hubble, oh man, that stuff gets for real. So the Hubble Space Telescope can see 10 times better than your home telescope on a resolution of about 0.1 arc seconds, which is the equivalent of being able to see a credit card in LA from where you're sitting right now. And the JWST, ooh, it's actually not that big of a resolution, but it's the same. Um, and the JWST offers a lot of really other cool stuff that is not resolution related, um, but uh, that, that's where space telescopes live. So now the question is, where does the EHT live? Is it, so we're working on 0.1 arc second scales now. Is it 0.01 arc seconds? Like a 10 times better than that? Well, actually we're gonna have to go on another trip. So we'll mosey on down to the Santa Barbara airport one more time. 
And this time we're traveling to my family's home in Boston, Massachusetts. We're gonna take an eight hour trip and fly 3000 miles, drive to my house and hold up the credit card. And the EHT could see it from where you're sitting right now. With a resolution of 20 micro arc seconds, it can see a donut on the moon or an atom held at arm's width. Yeah, so it could, it could, see, it could see a credit card 3,000 miles away, but not just see the credit card, right? All the other stuff I'm saying, you can just barely make out the credit card. The EHT could read the numbers off the credit card from where you're sitting and, and use it to buy a non-janky hydrogen maser clock. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your credit limit's high. Uh, so, so, okay, so suddenly these aren't just 16 pixels, right? They're the most, the 16 most precise and highest resolution pixels in all of human history. So what can we learn from these pixels, right? Why are they so crucial to our understanding of the universe? So to understand this, we need to take a moment to understand the light that we're seeing, right? Why does this image look like a glowing donut or like Sauron's eye, or there's so many memes about what the image looks like. So the reality is we're not actually seeing the black hole, right? The black hole swallows in all the light that gets inside it. So we're not gonna see anything from the black hole, but Photons are emitted from the glowing gas around the black hole constantly. The gravitational pull of the black hole is so strong that it can change the direction the light itself is going. So if the light is too close, it'll just fall in. But if it's just outside the region of no return, the photons will get bent and twisted and eventually leave, resulting in us, the observers, seeing a glowing ring surrounding a patch of darkness. And this patch of darkness is called the shadow of the black hole. And since this shadow is a direct proxy for the gravitational strength of the black hole, we can use it to test general relativity, Einstein's theory for how gravity works on large scales. So well, on all scales, really. But um, so like, here's an example. So if the gravity, we, we, we have estimates of the mass of this black hole. And if, because we know how gravity works, supposedly according to general relativity, we can estimate how big the shadow would be. If the gravity is stronger than we expect, then it'll pull in photons from farther away. And you'll get something like the image on the right where the shadow is a lot bigger than we thought. If the gravity is really weak, it'll only be able to pull in photons that are close by, and it'll get something more like the image on the left. But it turns out that uh, the boring answer was the right one, which is that general relativity was correct, again, like it has been every single time for the last 100 years. Um, but that's pretty cool, you know, GR is right. So if GR is correct, what can we do with that? Well, we can look at these images and we can extract information from them, information like the mass of the black hole and how fast it's spinning, its angular momentum, and its inclination relative to us, so how it's tilted. And that's really interesting, but this is also where it gets really tricky because black holes do have different properties. Just because M87, the first image, and Zaj star, the image in the center of our galaxy, look very similar and are both supermassive, it doesn't mean they're both supermassive, if you know what I mean. So let's start with the black hole in the center of our galaxy. This is our, the image, spoiler alert. Um, it's pretty big, right? Four million solar masses and about a thousand, about 10,000 times smaller than what Ronnie said at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> Sorry, Ronnie, that, that set me up for failure, man. Sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> so four million solar masses. If you put it in the center of the solar system, the shadow would stretch past Mercury's orbit. That's how big it is, right? Big, right? But it's peanuts compared to M87. M87 is many, many times larger than Sagittarius star and our solar system and has a whopping 6 billion solar masses crammed in there. So if you put the I mean, shadow at the center of our solar system, that circle, that little, uh, is my laser pointer work? That little white circle, that's Pluto's orbit. That's the extent of our solar system. That white dot is Voyager 1, the farthest ever man-made anything ever. And we wouldn't even make it out of the little black thing that's like the fake shadow. Um, so these things are really, really, really big. Now here's the issue. So even though these black holes look very similar, we're talking about two different, very different regimes here. So on the one hand, it would take light about eight minutes to get from one side of Sagittarius star shadow to the other. Uh, more like four minutes, but uh, four to eight minutes. Uh, but for M87, it would take four days to do the same. So very different regimes with very different consequences. So M87 needs time to move stuff around because it's so large, right? It evolves really slowly. It makes it easy to take a picture of. Like taking a picture of a giant tortoise walking across a lovely meadow. You know, it's just gonna do its thing. You know, you can set up your camera, set up your lights, take your time. Like, it's not going anywhere. You're taking a picture of the turtle, not despite it. <laughs> Meanwhile, the cocaine addicted Sagittarius star can evolve <laughs> and change completely in just a few minutes, making it more akin to desperately trying to take a picture of your hyperactive toddler pretending she is a flash. Um, <laughs> Another good analogy to this, a surprisingly good analogy to this is uh, panoramas. You know when you take a panorama, but someone like moves and it results in a skewed image that uh, does not reflect reality? <laughs> That's actually surprisingly close, right? The cats aren't really this long. 
but if you didn't know, if you didn't know what was going into making this image, you might think, for example, that horses have only two legs. <laughs> I love you guys. Uh, so, so, so yeah, it's a challenge with Sag Star because of how fast it evolves. But the thing is, we really, really, really want to make an accurate image of these things, especially in such a fast-moving environment. In such a fast-moving environment, we'd be able to see the black hole dragging space and time around with it. If we could get a high resolution of the image of the shadow, we could fit special shapes to it that would allow us to extract all of the information you could possibly think of from it. It's a really, really powerful probe into the most extreme environment in the universe. But this is a challenge to do for a number of reasons. And the challenges involved boil, boil down to two big things. The variability of the source and the sparsity of the coverage. I'm going to explain what both of those are. So let's start with variability. So how variable is Sag star? So in order to characterize Sag star's variability, oh, did you see the simulated data thing pop up for a second? That's a holdover from when I was not supposed to share the data. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is real data. Um, uh, so in order uh, to characterize Sag star's variability and determine if it will be a problem for our imaging, we have to like zoom way out. And so we can look at the light curves cap captured by our most sensitive single stations, like the Atacama Large Millimeter Array or ALMA, and we can observe fluctuations in the overall brightness of the source and use that to infer variability. So in essence, we're kind of like measuring the pulse of Sag star. And just like how a rapidly beating heart indicates a human body in motion, from Sag star's light curve, it can tell us how active the underlying black hole is. But it can be a little confusing to understand what's happening here. So let's start with the plot on the left. The plot on the left is showing how bright Sag star is as a function of time. So on the y-axis, we have brightness. And on the y uh, x-axis, we have time. And Sag star is getting dimmer and then brighter and dimmer again. Uh, uh, very, very interesting. And so, but how can we actually use that to determine how variable the object is? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Apparently, I'm going a little too fast. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm just very nervous and excited to be here. <laughs> um, so how can we actually use this to determine how variable the object is? So the brightness is changing due to a physical process propagating across the black hole environment, which takes time. So a surprisingly good analogy is to this, and you'll hear me say this a lot in this talk, is a Newton's cradle. So everyone's played with these, right? You pull one ball back, knocks the other one. The force travels through the balls and knocks the other end ball flying into the air, and the cycle repeats. This is a really good analog for a physical system. So a physical process is starting at one end of the Newton's cradle, or the black hole. It's propagating across the Newton's cradle, or the black hole environment, and it's causing the brightness to change. Or in the Newton's cradle case, it's causing the ball at the other end to swing up and down. The smaller the system, the faster the process will move across it, right? You can imagine if you had, instead of four balls here, five balls here. And if you had, instead of five balls here, you had 50 or 500, it would take a lot longer for the force to get across because the force is traveling in finite time. So what if we like only restricted our view to just the cradle ball swinging up and down? If we track its motion, it'll look like it's oscillating. And the time scales that are associated with this oscillation are intuitively associated with the size of the system. So if we can, if in, in this analog, if we can only see the brightness, we can use it to infer the distance a physical process would have to travel in order to change the brightness this quickly. And this gives us the size of our system. And if the system size is very small, in other words, big stuff is happening very quickly on small scales, the system is very variable and that will make it very hard to image. So let's actually apply this to Sag star. So we can get a characteristic frequency out of the light curve by looking at the power spectrum. And that tells, tells us, basically tells us how fast is the heart beating. So let's assume the system is some object that has size delta and it's pulsing, right? You're seeing this frequency change, this uh, brightness change with frequency V. The ratio between the fastest speed something can travel, which is the speed of light, and the frequency that we observe gives us the maximum size of the object. This, if we actually calculate this, it turns out to be about 10 to the 12 meters. So a trillion meters, which sounds like a lot of meters, but it's actually only 22 times the size of the gravitational radius of the black hole. So only 22 times bigger than the black hole. And that's exactly the region we'll be imaging in. So all I've managed to convince you guys of is that this is going to be a tough thing to image. It's going to be a lot harder than M87. And unfortunately, that's it. There's no magic here that's going to fix the variability for us. This is just, we have to characterize it and say, yep, this is going to be a problem. And that's why the first image came out in three years, and the second one took five. <laughs> OK, so to understand why variability is a problem, though, we need to get into problem number two, which is the sparsity of the interferometer. But before we even do that, we should probably ask, how does an interferometer actually work? So all right, let's start with your basic telescope. Uh, the te resolution of a telescope uh, is determined by the wavelength of light that it observes at divided by the diameter of its collecting area. This is pretty intuitive, right? You get a bigger telescope, it's going to be able to see smaller things. 
But when you link two telescopes together via magic, I mean, uh, interferometry, <laughs> their resolution no longer becomes a function of their individual collecting areas. It becomes a function of the distance between them. And so this is like a life hack, right? Because you can just take two tiny telescopes and place them on opposite ends of the globe and you'll have an amazing resolution. But there's a catch. Of course, it can't be that easy. Um, when you do this, uh, execute this magic spell, uh, the telescopes no longer see the image on the sky. They see something special called a Fourier transform. And a Fourier transform is this mathematical uh, transformation. You give it an input function, like this square wave here, just goes straight up down. And then it will, the Fourier transform will tell you how to make this function out of a bunch of sines and cosines. And this is really convenient because uh, light is a bunch of sines and cosines, it's a bunch of waves. And so this is a really convenient and physical way to represent this kind of function. And so this is what the telescopes will see. But they won't see, um, sorry, an, a really important property of the Fourier transform is this. So if you take the Fourier transform of a function and you Fourier transform it again, you get the original function back out. And that's a really helpful property. It's called invertibility. Basically, yes, we're only seeing the Fourier transform of the object in the sky, but all we have to do is take the Fourier transform it up again and we'll get the original image back out. So what if your, uh, Fourier, what if your image function is not a square wave? but a black hole, which by the way, they're basically the same thing. Um, <laughs> it's a little unintuitive, but it's actually, that's actually correct. Uh, the Fourier transform of a black hole image looks more like this. So uh, it's like this ripple pattern called the Bessel function. And uh, now how, what does the interferometer actually see, right? This is like perfect. So if you took the image and just directly Fourier transform it, it's not exactly what the telescope sees. The telescope sees this. So you have your two telescopes linked as an interferometer. They're connected by a, a vector called a baseline. And like all vectors, this baseline has magnitude and direction. And the two telescopes observe a combinatorial data product called a visibility. Now, the visibility that they observe corresponds to the point in the Fourier plane with that exact same magnitude and direction. So if you have many telescopes, each pair of telescopes forms a baseline with its own magnitude and direction. And together, they probe more of the UV space. So the EHC has eight stations observing for a whole night, and they produce this wonderful dot map uh, of this sparse sampling of the of the Fourier transform, and that's what that means, by the way. So we're not covering much, right? Just what the what we just what the white dots see, um, and that's the sparsity of the interferometer. But it is it, it is a really good way to get good resolution. So if you take the wavelength of light that we could observe at in 2017, the absolute like bliss, bleeding edge, you know, 1.3 millimeters of radio telescopes at the time, and you divide it by the diameter of the Earth, which is uh, basically as far as we could possibly put two ground-based telescopes, you get 25 micro arc second resolution, which is just enough, just enough to resolve the shadow of the largest black hole in the sky. Um, and that's why the image is only four pixels by four pixels, because even this extreme resolution is just barely enough to actually see it. Okay, so we're back to the incomplete coverage problem, right? So the problem with the Fourier transform is you need all of this information, all the purple and yellow and black, in order to get the image out but we only have what's in the white dots. So how do we solve this? And the solution is robust imaging. So robust imaging is all about inverting the Fourier transform. When you hear imaging a black hole, this is what this is actually referring to, inverting the Fourier transform to get an image out. And this requires some assumptions, which we try to minimize. And we minimize these assumptions, right? It has to require assumptions because you're taking, you're taking information and then you're only sampling part of it and then you're trying to get all the information back out. So you need to make some assumptions. And there are different approaches that we use which make different assumptions. So the two main approaches that we use are called regularized maximum likelihood, really rolls right off the tongue, uh, or RML, versus the clean iterative imaging approach. So clean is nice. It's an inverse modeling approach, extremely established and historical. Um, it's been used for decades. And basically, it takes the Fourier transform and it says, OK, I'm going to assume everything I can't see is 0. And then it just inverts the Fourier transform and does an iterative procedure to clean up the image. And uh, that sounds like a horrendous assumption, but it actually works very well. There's a problem with this procedure though, it only gives you one solution. So uh, if there are any statisticians in here, you'll know that if you have, uh, if you, if you have fewer um, data points than your, you know, uh, then the function can, uh, sorry, if you have fewer data points than parameters in your function, your function will be unconstrained. And so you can technically have infinite solutions. And that's the case for our images too. There are technically an infinite number of images that can fit the data. And clean only gives you one. So that could be it. It could be the wrong one. It could be the right one. Uh, and the other problem is these images can vary quite drastically depending on the expertise of the user. So uh, this is a little alarming, but it's true. Uh, so you like give two people, two different clean experts, the same data, and sometimes they'll produce different images because it's a very inherently like a, a procedure you learn how to use and get good at. So the alternative is regularized maximum likelihood. So this is a forward modeling approach. Instead of taking your data and inverting it to get an image, 
it checks every possible image to see which one fits the data best. So this is a, this is a movie of the procedure actually running. Um, so you can see it's like going through a bunch of images to try to see which ones fit the data best. And it's determining the fit based on those chi-squared values at the top. And it works extremely well. It also has another benefit, which is it provides a representative set of images, right? Because it's basically checking every possible image. So it can tell you, hey, here's what all the possible images look like. And if they all look the same, you can say, oh, my data is very good. If they don't look the same, you're like, oh, I guess I'm imaging my assumptions instead. Here's the problem though with RML, it requires some hefty assumptions. So you have to bring in like outside info in order for it to be more effective. And it relies a lot on your parameter choices. You can generally avoid this uh, bias by being careful with your parameter choices. But the reality is if you choose the right parameters, you can make any image, including a picture of yourself, pop out of uh, the imaging algorithm. So, so I've, got a, I've got a quick question for you guys. <laughs> yeah, we actually tested that, that is true. Um, <laughs> I've got a quick question for you guys. Um, of these two approaches, which one do you think is better? RML, hold up your hands if you think RML is better. All right, and clean. Oh, <laughs> so the, uh, that's interesting, interesting spread. So uh, the actual answer is we use both approaches and then check them against each other. <laughs> and they both gave the same result, which is a very good vote of confidence. It means we're insensitive to our, our approach, which is very good. But there was still a problem. Uh, so when we take the, when we take test data that evolves like Sagi Star, this hotspot image on the hotspot movie on the left, um, and plug it into our imaging algorithms, we get really bad movies out. Believe it or not, that's a movie on the right. It, it's actually playing, but it's like impossible to tell. See, that, that's like a legit movie. It's like doing stuff. I don't know if you kind of see that, but obviously it's not representing the original the original uh, synthetic data. So what's actually going on here? And to kind of get into the heart of what's going on, we have to, I'm gonna use this visualization of our interferometer. So on the left, we have two baselines formed by uh, two, sorry, a baseline formed by two sites. And they're measuring that blue dot in the Fourier transform. So, uh, so that's the baseline. And you can see if like, if you like flip the X axis, right? This line corresponds to this, so the same angle and size. Um, and then uh, it produces a data point. And if we do this throughout the whole night, as new to more telescopes come into view, they probe more and more of the Fourier transform. Now, this is fine if your source is stable over a whole night, but a Sagittarius star isn't. Sagittarius star, in between these dots popping up, Sagittarius star is changing. So we can only use subsets of the data at the time to produce an image. And uh, <laughs> that's a problem. So if we make a movie, for example, of like a fake source like this, so this is a static ring, okay? Nothing's changing in this movie. It's just a single static ring. And we produce a reconstruction of every single like frame of the observation. This is what we get. A lot of garbage. And then very briefly for a second, a good, it just looks like, oh no, it's gone. Uh, it's, no, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so a couple of good frames in a whole observation of like, you know, like LA garbage. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> so uh, we want to be able to pull those best frames out, but there's an issue, right? Anyone who's done data stuff knows that what I'm saying is setting off big red flags. Um, <laughs> you can't just pick the frames that you think look best, right? We don't know what Sagittarius star is supposed to look like. We could be picking the wrong frames for all we know. So can we predict where those good regions will be without needing to like bias ourselves to the right answer? And the answer is actually yes. So the selected dynamical imaging method created this formula. You plug in your UV coverage into it, and it will tell you how good the reconstruction will be without ever needing to know what you're looking at. And this is really powerful because it means you, you're, never biased, you're never biased with this method. You could literally run this procedure years before you ever took data, and it will be right every single time. Um, so you're not, we're not worrying about, uh, you know, it's not, we're not cherry picking the data. So if we apply to the Sagi star data, we basically see that there are clear regions where the score is higher than others, and that's where we expect the reconstruction to be the best. And if we image in those regions, we get much better results. So this, the method of selected dynamical imaging was basically how it made it possible to produce accurate images with very limited coverage, and it overhauled the imaging process for objects like Sagi star and made it possible to produce the images that, you, that, that, that you've seen. Okay, so I've gone all into the imaging and the telescope and the horror stories. Um, let's talk about the image. Okay, what does it tell us? And I'm going to need a drink. I get very animated in this bit. I know, more animated? Sorry. <laughs> I can hear you guys thinking it. <laughs> okay, so you guys are a great audience. Seriously, I appreciate you guys laughing at my terrible dad jokes. <laughs> so, what is this image? It's a second image of a black hole ever. That right there, like mic drop moment, right? 
And it's the first image of the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. That's pretty cool because up until this point, we weren't really sure there was a black hole in the first place. That we were like pretty sure, but like, you know, there was always like that 1% chance that GR was wrong and Einstein was a kook. And um, there's like a gravis star in the middle there. It's like a big dark matter cluster, but no, it's a black hole. And it's a really beautiful looking black hole in my opinion. But um, so this is a really cool image because this is actually the first horizon level structure connection to the stellar orbits we saw earlier. So that's what that object is right there. That was swinging the stars around. That's the black hole. That's what it's doing that stuff. And it makes sense, right? It, it was mind blowing because those stars are many times more massive than our sun, but that black hole is 4 million times more massive than our sun. So it kind of, kind of, it checks out. Uh, so what else is this? All right, so this image is just like the M87 image is a test of general relativity, right? We can use the same thing. We can take a look at the, um, we can take a look at the size of the ring and confirm that it matches our expectations from general relativity. And we've confirmed once again, that general relativity is, despite how boring it is, correct. Um, <laughs> But this is really powerful, right? Because now we have a test of general, we have tests of general relativity that span three orders of magnitude and mass in black hole. We've confirmed that a black hole, I mean, look how similar this image is to the N87 one. We've confirmed that black holes of millions of solar masses function exactly like black holes of billions of solar masses. And that's really, really interesting. It'd be like if you took a picture of the bacteria on your skin and they were like dressing up and driving out and going to an astronomy talk on a Friday night, like, it'd be like whoa, everything's functioning the same. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, so that's really, really interesting. And that's kind of like, that's kind of like the, the, you know, the, the really nitty gritty about why this image is interesting, but there's also a much more like higher level, beautiful reason that poor Sandy has heard about 10 times by now. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is a picture, and this is what it really means, this is what it means to me. Like, this is kind of more of a, oh no. <laughs> okay. I'm going to keep talking. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a picture of where physics breaks down. And that's kind of a weird concept to wrap your head around. So let me tell you a little story. In the last hundred years, there have been two major theories of physics that have been wildly, wildly, wildly successful. And there are people in this room that have worked on both of those theories. Um, general relativity, right, describes really big, really massive things developed by Einstein in the early 1900s. And uh, it's been tested again and again and again and again. And I, I can't tell you the, the, the level of this testing, right? The very first test was like, was mind boggling, right? Eddington, Arthur Eddington, um, you know, took pictures of, the, uh, of stars before and after a solar eclipse to determine conclusively that the light was being bent by the sun's presence during the solar eclipse. And that was the first real test of general relativity. And then a few years later, you know, they showed that GR could explain the precession of the merc mercurial orbit. You know, the fact that it's not just moving like an ellipse, it's like moving like a little flower. Um, and so it's just passed test again and again and again. More recently, it's passed the gravity probe B test, right? Where we use uh, the, gra the weak gravitational field of the earth to adjust a gyroscope in a satellite by a millionth of a millionth of a hair. And that was enough to prove that GR was working around earth. And then we went even bigger in scale, right? With LIGO detecting gravitational waves, two black holes colliding, you know, millions of light years away. Create, we're creating ripples in the fabric of space time that flex the earth and the whole Milky Way galaxy and the whole universe. And then there was the image, uh, first image of M87, right? The first evidence of a horizon in the universe, a place, right? This is an image of a horizon, a place where nothing has ever come out of. Anything that goes into there stays there. It doesn't come back. It's a gateway or, a, or an exit. It's, it's, it has a deep philosophical, uh, you know, it asks a deep philosophical question, but it answers a, an even more important question in my opinion about general relativity, which is, horizons in the universe exist. So over and over and over again, general relativity has been proven correct again and again and again and again. Now there's a second theory called quantum mechanics. You've probably heard of it. <laughs> um, quantum mechanics also has been tested rigorously. It describes the very, very small and the very, very fast things like photons and subatomic particles. And it has been tested over and over and over again for the last hundred years. And we've developed this beautiful thing called the standard model. And like general relativity has been proven correct again and again and again. And it's difficult to overstate how correct quantum mechanics has been, because it has predicted some weird stuff. And every time we thought, okay, this is too weird, even for quantum mechanics, time to go to the quantum mall and get a new theory. Every time we thought that, it was like, oh no, actually we were the wrong ones. We were interpreting the experiment wrong. We, our conception was outdated. That's how right quantum mechanics has been. So these two unbreakable, never incorrect theories, right? one describes things that are very big and very heavy, and one describes things that are very small and very fast. 
And uh, the problem is black holes are both big and heavy and small and fast, right? They're huge, six billion solar masses. This one's four million solar masses. That is massive by any, any definition. And we use general relativity to make all the predictions for this image. But it's also very, very small, right? It's all this mass is compressed into a point of infinite density, basically. Uh, so we can also technically use quantum mechanics to describe what's happening in here. And it's a perfect opportunity for our two perfect theories to uh, go head to head. And when we ask them what happens in the center of this thing, these two, in, these two always correct theories that have never been wrong, the always correct ones, they give completely different answers. <laughs> and that's severely problematic because like one of them has to be wrong. And if it's GR, that's a huge problem. If it's quantum mechanics, that's a really, really, really big problem. <laughs> like, I mean, everything that we know about physics, if we prove that one of these things is wrong, everything we know about physics would change drastically overnight. And we have a picture that says, yeah, things exist where one of those things is wrong. And we have no idea which. And it keeps me up at night in a good and a bad way. Um, and, but it's the excitement. It's what, in my opinion, it's the, one of the most exciting questions in physics, which is, you know, now we can't ignore this problem anymore. Before we could say, yeah, you know, what's a black hole anyway? Like, you know, so do you have one? Like, do you prove it? <laughs> but now we can say, hey, here's a picture. Theorists get cracking. Like, what, what the, what's going on? <laughs> um, and so that's really, really interesting to me. And so, yeah, we can ask all these philosophical questions all day long. Um, but we can also do, you know, like your, you know, your hardworking everyday factory physicist uh, stuff with this image, which includes drawing rulers on it and making measurements. So uh, we can draw a ring on the image and uh, find out that it's about, you know, 50-ish micro arc seconds in size. We can measure the width, you know, like a dentist checking your whatevers. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm not a dentist. I don't know tooth words. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can take a look at these like hotspots and these blobs. Like, what are they, you know? Are they friendly? Are they even real? Uh, there's, a very, there's a very good argument that these blobs might not actually be real. It might be a product of our imaging algorithms. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's start with the ring size. So we have a ring size, 50 micro arc seconds. Uh, we can plug this into a very simple formula that will tell us the mass of the black hole. And surprise, surprise, we were able to confirm pre-existing measurements and confirm that Sege star has a black hole mass of 4 million solar masses. That is a lot of solar masses, uh, but it lines up basically exactly what was predicted already um, from other experimental observations, except this is, of course, the most precise estimate uh, of this mass. So uh, what else can we do, right? We can take a look at this image and we can compare it to a massive library of simulations. And this is really neat because we can look at the simulations and simulate observations with the HT and say, hey, you know, this simulation kind of looks like uh, the black hole image. And so we can compare it, uh, the best fitting simulation to the black hole image and ask the computer, hey, um, what parameters did you use to generate this black hole? And it will tell us, hey, you know, this black, the black hole you've taken a picture of looks like uh, the simulation I made where, and by I, I mean the computer, not me. Um, the simulation, uh, you know, the computer made with a 30 degree inclination. So, I mean, it's like kind of, I mean, you're not looking at, at it right down the barrel, which would be bad for our health. But you're also not looking at it like edge on, like interstellar style. Um, it's also apparently a magnetically arrested disk. So that's really interesting because it means all the material around the black hole is caught in the magnetic field and it's kind of being dragged around as this very, very, very high energy object uh, is like bending space and time with it. And the, the accretion matter has a prograde spin. So all the stuff that's swirling around the black hole, uh, it turns out that it's moving in the same direction that the black hole itself is spinning. And that's not necessarily uh, required. And so it's really interesting to see that yet again, um, the black hole seems to have this property. And so we can measure these properties for all the black holes we can take image of, images of, you know, all two of them. Um, and uh, and uh, we can add them to our black hole zoo. And this will allow us to, you know, build up these demographic surveys and uh, ask and answer questions about, you know, how black holes evolve and what kind of distributions they have in the universe. And this helps us answer questions about how the universe evolved and what its ultimate fate will be. Uh, okay, so that's the Sagittarius star image stuff. So what's next, right? I've given a lot of stuff to you, but it's not. This is not a, a bygone result that I'm just talking about. This is some real science is happening right now. Um, so what's next for the EHT? And the short answer is we're going to sharpen everything. So we're moving to space VLBI. I'm actually participating in a conference later this month where we will be designing the mission parameters for a space VLBI concept. Um, so why are we going to space, and what does space VLBI mean? Basically, right, you have the concept where uh, you can take two telescopes and place them further and further apart. It gives you better and better interferometric resolution. Um, and that's really exciting, but there's a limit on how much you can put those telescopes apart because the Earth is only so big. Um, I wish it would be bigger, but, you know, the, them's, the, them's the cards. I don't make the rules. 
Um, so a one, an easier solution, <laughs> easier than you know, making the Earth bigger, is <laughs> to go, go to space. So we have lots of space telescopes in there already, but this is really challenging for the for the EHT. So a space telescope, it's already like it's already you know a, a really really hard thing to do. But the EHT, that each station in the EHT has to know exactly where it is in the universe. Um, that's why we need these crazy atomic clocks and these unbelievably precise global positioning systems because the telescopes have to know the exact distance to each other in wavelengths of light. Like that's how we measure. When you look at those plots of like the, the Fourier transform, the x-axis is measured in number of wavelengths of light. Um, so like, you know, we measure, oh, you know, the, the distance from the, the, green, the Greenland telescope and the South Pole telescope is, you know, like 10 billion wavelengths of light and it's at the wavelength we observe at. And so you have to know your, your location on the earth to within that number of you know, wavelengths of light. And it's a very difficult challenge, made even more challenging by having to do it in space, you know, where, where, where nobody knows exactly where you are down to that, that, kind of, uh, that kind of precision. In fact, our telescopes, the, global, the ground telescopes are so precise that the United States Geological Survey uses them to measure continental drift because they know their distances to each other so well, they can measure the continents drifting apart because they can see the distance to each other changing. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty cool, but again, really challenging to do in space. But if we can go out to longer baselines, we'll have much better resolution. So for example, we partnered with NASA very recently to uh, potentially put, a, uh, uh, potentially put a, um, a radio telescope one meter on the International Space Station, uh, or even one on the Origin Space Telescope, which will be out, going out to join JWST sometime in the next uh, one to two centuries. Uh, <laughs> man, there are a lot of people who know about the origins delays. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that would be amazing, right? You'd have a million mile long baseline and you can't imagine the science we could do with just one million mile long baseline. With just a single million mile long baseline, you can measure like basically every black hole you can think of and immediately probe its mass and spin, like with just literally a couple data points. It's that, it's that incredible. Um, so uh, aside from that though, right, because as much as I'd like to, I can't just shoot a satellite into space, um, that's gonna take probably decades. So what's next? Well, we're not stopping there. We're also upgrading the entire EHT ground array. So we're adding more telescopes, which gives us more uh, spatial, uh, which gives us more spatial density. So ideally, right, the ideal scenario would be the whole earth is just covered in telescopes. And that's a personal fantasy. It may not be shared by everybody, <laughs> um, uh, but that would be the ideal case for the EHT. Um, but we're, we're doing the next best thing, which is putting telescopes in as many places as we can, you know, like we're, we've got a new telescope that we're developing in Africa, we're putting telescopes in, hopefully in China, um, shopping malls, you know, movie theaters, <laughs> bolted to the roof of your house. <laughs> uh, you, you get tax credits, you let us put a telescope on your roof. <laughs> uh, so that'll be great. But also, you know, we're, uh, we're improving the frequency of the telescope. So all the stuff that I've shown you, um, these images are made at uh, 230 gigahertz, which is radio wavelengths. Um, but recently, when I say recently, I mean, literally last month, we just tested an observation where about half of our telescopes were online for a 345 gigahertz. And from a technical perspective, the observation was a smashing success. From a realistic perspective, the weather sucked. Um, so we did not get any very, good, we did not get good data. Um, but we, we, did, we, we do, we are working on upgrading the, uh, the resolution of these telescopes. So 345 gigahertz from 230 to 345, instantly 50% better resolution. So those images that you saw will be getting a lot sharper coming very soon. That's like the, the space blue guy stuff that's like kind of longer term, but this stuff is like happening right now. Like in the next year, couple of years, you can expect to see really exciting um, new measurements. Uh, also, and this is partially space will be I partially ground based, but we like more frequent time sampling. So we've been making images so far, but if you had an orbiter that was orbiting Earth every 90 minutes, instead of having to wait 12 hours for the Earth to like kind of slowly turn itself around, you could make movies of black holes. And like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. And that's like a per area of very personal interest for me. So I, I, I mean, the selective dynamical imaging method is basically, it's basically a, my, like my unwritten love letter to making black hole movies. Uh, possible. And so I think that's, that's going to be coming up really soon. And I'm very personally excited about that. So um, I made this uh, janky graphic to uh, kind of put the future of VLBI into perspective for you. So um, this is where we are now. Uh, images like this, blurry at best. Um, we got a lot of comments when we like post, you know, when we uh, share our results from people who are like, you know, they're very sweet, very kind hearted people who just want the best for the science and the results. And like, you know, this is a really cool guys. You did such a great job. But like next, next time, you know, like play with the focus a little bit. <laughs> like, just, just a little bit, you know. They're like, you know, you know, cannons have an autofocus feature. <laughs> and we're like, oh, 
we didn't, oh, wow, we didn't think of that. Uh, we'll make, definitely make sure to do that next time. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we're currently at this stage, right? We're on the ground-based section of the book. Um, and uh, we can only see a couple marbles, which I've creatively used to represent black holes here. Um, but uh, yeah, and I forgot I animated the arrow to point to the marbles. I forgot that a little bit too late. But uh, so in the future, though, once we move to space, we'll be able to see like literally a thousand times more black holes than we currently can, because uh, there are plenty of black holes in the sky, but they're just really, really small. Um, or they're, they're big, but they're very far away. And so once we get better resolution, you know, we can see smaller things, we'll be able to see more of these black holes. Um, but more importantly, the current images we do have will get a lot better. So right when you go to space while BI, instead of these images being super blurry, um, we'll be able to make these beautiful, like precise images of the black hole's photon rings. And that's really, that's the shadow bit of the black hole that will tell us all the good information. That's like the, the, the you know, the innermost stable circular orbit where photons are orbiting many times before they escape. That's the really interesting bit. So there's all sorts of really interesting stuff on the horizon for this. This, this, this is just truly just the beginning of uh, what we can do with Space Field BI and EHT. So I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for listening and to the SBAU for uh, getting uh, inviting me to do this talk. It's been a, genuinely a privilege. Hey, one little presentation that I know is that he covered 120 nearby slides in under an hour. <laughs> I always give myself two minutes per slide, but congratulations. <laughs> so um, we're going to have a few questions if you would like. Oh, I see a question from the chat too. Okay. Yeah. But let me start with that. Yeah, can you yeah. repeat the question that you have in the chat? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I guess we'll start with this one person put a question in the chat. Also, I need to make a quick clarification. The slide numbers are inaccurate. So uh, um, I, when I animate stuff, I do it on separate slides. So it shows up in PDFs. Um, so that's why it looks like there's 112 slides. <laughs> um, sorry, so the question in the chat, uh, can Hawking radiation be seen? Um, unlikely. So what Hawking radiation is, for those who don't know, is that, uh, uh, right? From the quantum foam, you have particle and antiparticle pairs being spawned at every point in space. This is just the natural energy of space time producing these particles. And usually they, a particle and an antiparticle will spawn and then immediately find each other and annihilate. But uh, they can spawn right on the edge of a black hole, in which case the one that's inside the horizon will fall in. The one that's outside will escape. And so the black hole will slowly lose mass this way. I don't think that we'll ever be able to see Hawking radiation, to be honest. Like, I don't even know anyone that's working on it because it's literally like one particle at a time. Like, you know, you'd expect it to take 10 to 50 years for a black hole to lose all of its mass by a Hawking radiation. However, we are looking for the equivalent of Hawking radiation in like in physical black hole simulations that you can make with like water and stuff. So it turns out if you produce a funnel in water, it obeys a lot of the same laws as a GRMHD, which are the laws that govern black hole physics. And uh, we're, we, we found the equivalent of Hawking radiation in that, which is a good first step. That's a really good question. Uh, how about with the audience? Yes, sir. How is the current shadow Oh, you know, that's a really good question. That is a, that's a really interesting question. So um, the way the term shadow came about, so I was, I was telling this to a couple of people on the, on the way in, but uh, the, the term shadow was coined in a paper that was published. It was not published exactly. It was submitted to an online archive, October 29th, 1999, which was the day I was born. Um, so the, and that was the project that kicked off the EHT. Um, so it's been 20 years in the making. Um, but uh, so the, the term shadow is used in that paper specifically. I've spoken directly to the people that wrote that paper. Um, and the, the, reason, the, the reason they chose the term shadow is because black holes are imagined as uh, like a gravitational potential in front of a uniform like illumination screen. And so the idea is it's absorbing photons that are coming through and it casts a shadow on the screen and everything around it. Um, so that, that's, that's why it's called a shadow. Yeah. Uh, yes. In, in the animation showing all the, the stars that are orbiting mm -hmm. around the black hole, yes. what, what's the time scale? What's the period of those orbits? So um, that movie is over uh, like 10 to 20 years. And so the periods are like the stars you know, whizzing around like, on, the, on the order of like a couple of years. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm sorry if it was addressed, but why did we use radio to observe mm -hmm. these black holes? That is a really good question that I did not address, actually. So that's a fantastic question. So why 230 gigahertz radiation, right? So there's a couple of reasons, um, a couple of very like very fine-tuning reasons as to why this works. So first of all, 
Um, black holes produce 230 gigahertz, gigahertz radiation. Pretty much nothing else does. <laughs> um, that, that's an exaggeration, but like um, the, the, like most things don't really produce this kind of very energetic radiation uh, at, at this level that we could see. So uh, it's like very characteristic of the light that's just outside the black hole. There are actually really interesting simulations that show when you look at um, wavelengths that are shorter or longer than 230 gigahertz, you see almost like different slices of detail in the black hole. Uh, now, the, the, the thing is though, you can, you can go to higher wave, longer wavelengths or shorter ones. So why do we pick this one? Um, so the uh, Earth's atmosphere is our biggest issue. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs a lot of light, but it has a, like a dip at 230 gigahertz. Um, and so we, we uh, image exactly in that dip, we observe exactly in that dip to minimize the effect of the Earth's atmosphere on our observations. The next closest dip to that that gives us high resolution is 345 gigahertz. And that's why we picked that for the observations. Why not optical, Ooh, okay. So a couple of reasons. So first of all, um, optical light. Oh yeah, so the question was, so we use radio, why not optical light? Um, so with, uh, so, okay, so uh, um, with optical light, uh, wait, so that, I mean, there's a bunch of reasons. The first of all, interferometer gets really hard uh, as, you go to, as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths. Um, so you, you need to measure everything way more precisely. You need to keep track of the timestamps much, much better. And uh, visible light is like many, many times uh, shorter and more difficult than, to work with than, than radio light. And that's, that's a, from, a, from an instrumentation perspective, that's uh, in order to view these kinds of objects, that's a big reason. Another big reason is that in optical light, this just looks like a, like a washed out blob. Um, it's like looking directly into a projector screen as I'm doing right now. Um, I can't see any detail in there because the light is just overwhelming everything. These things produce a ton of light. And so optical light would not be the most useful to uh, observe th this, these kinds of objects. So uh, like for example, Sagittarius star is surrounded by a bunch of interstellar dust that absorbs a ton of optical light, but this wavelength of light gets right through. Um, and so that's why we, that's, there's a bunch of reasons why we pick it and that's just a couple. Sure. Um, Images, uh, some reason you can't get more right now. Oh, yeah. So, um, we observe once a year. Uh, we have 10 days to observe, and then uh, we have 10 days to observe, and then uh, we pick usually like five or six of those days that have the best weather. Uh, so this is one image. This is an image made from just one day of observations. We have tried to make images of the other days. This was the day that worked out worked best, so we put it out first. Um, so we can produce a couple more images, but they'll be very comparable to this. No, 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 I mean other black holes. Oh, other black holes. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that's a really good question. So um, these two are the only black holes whose shadows we can see on the sky uh, because of our resolution. Once we go to higher resolution, we'll be able to see many more black hole shadows. But these two, we can just barely see their shadows. Um, that, that's pretty much it. So it's, they, they, even though they're very different in mass, they actually look about the same size, about about, about the same size as what we can see, um, because such a star is a thousand times smaller than M87, but it's a thousand times closer. So they look exactly the same size on the sky. And uh, we're limited by our resolution. These are the only two we can see with our resolution. Uh, yeah. Did you just say something about the time resolution needed to do these observations? The time stamps depends on the frequency that you're observing at, of course. Yes. So. Um, uh, there's a couple different timestamps that are important to observations like these. So uh, the first is the actual timestamps that we observe, like we're collecting photon by photon from at the telescopes. Those are those are um, those timestamps are recorded on, uh, down to the nanosecond. So the idea is we record every single photon observed from these telescopes down to a nanosecond time scale at the telescopes individually. Then we ship the hard drives back to a supercomputer called a correlator that syncs up those nanosecond timescales exactly so we can know exactly when every photon hit what telescope and build out this virtual array. Um, once we do that though, and we reduce the data, it comes the, the time scale that we start worrying about becomes like roughly five to 10 minutes, which is something called a single scan. Like you're integrating uh, data over a certain period of time to improve your single noise. And, uh, and so yeah, this is a couple different time scales ranging from nanosecond to 10 minutes. Uh, Yes, the, the correlator, that, that's actually a really good question. The, the timestamps though, because the correlator stuff is so interesting to me, um, like in the way that the virtual telescope is constructed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so stars that you show rotating around black holes, mm -hmm. how fast are they going and how fast can they go? Do they get closer and closer to the approach to a light? Do they do that? Do they have to do that? So um, uh, when they approach the black hole, which some stars do, uh, they will get sheared and destroyed uh, by the black hole. It's called a tidal disruption event. Um, but uh, those stars, those are, they're in pretty good orbits. They're not decaying that much around the black hole. So I think for a while they, they keep orbiting. To be honest, I actually don't know what the velocities are of those stars off the top of my head. It's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure to answer that. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I know that masks thin are a thing that kind of like define a black hole, and I was wondering if there are black holes without thin. Ooh. Okay, so that's a phenomenal question. <laughs> it's actually very, very, very cool that you know that fact because that is not a that is not a common fact. What uh, you were what you were referring to is called the no hair theorem, which is that black holes are very simple objects that can be defined solely by their masses thin. Incredible that you knew that. Um, uh, the question, uh, sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question again? Um, are there black oh, holes yeah. that have spin? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Black holes can exist without a spin. They're called Schwarzschild black holes. Black holes with spin are called Kerr black holes, and black holes with spin and charge are called Kerr Newman black holes. We have only ever found evidence of Kerr and Kerr Newman black holes. We've never seen Schwarzschild black holes. Um, even the slowest spinning black holes still have some amount of angular momentum. It's very difficult not to. Black holes, like stellar mass black holes, will inherit their angular momentum from the star that blew up and became them, or they'll get it from the material swirling around them. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't think you'll ever find a black hole that is not just truly not spinning, but they technically can exist. That was a really good question. Yeah. So what's the next candidate for a black hole? Okay, so uh, if you ask that question in an EHT room, you would start a fight. Um, <laughs> I, I have a very personal, I have, like a, I have my own personal opinion on this, which I'm happy to share. Um, so uh, if we have a bunch of candidates that can look at, right, even during a single observation, we look at many uh, different black holes. So in the last two years, we published papers on black holes like 3 c 79 um, J1924. Uh, and those are black holes that we can't see their shadows, but we can see parts outside the shadows, basically. They're, they're far away too far away to see the shadows, but we can still see them. The black hole that I think would be the coolest image, and I defy, I will argue this to the ground with anyone. Um, I think we should image a black hole called OJ287X. It's huge. It's like 18 billion solar masses. So it's three times more massive than the M87, which is the biggest black hole that we've ever imaged. But it's also really interesting. So it's not just enormous. It also, we think, ha is, a, is actually a binary black hole system. So there's a big black hole that's about 18 billion solar masses. And then there's a little black hole that's, you know, paltry 100 million solar masses that is orbiting that big black hole and every now and then punches through its accretion disk and sets up this huge flare. And I think that would be so cool to make a movie of. Um, <laughs> and that's usually where I lose people in the EHT. But uh, uh, that's what I would, I, that would be my personal preference to the next candidate. But we do have a lot lined up for uh, when we improve our resolution. Sure. Um, this is what I, um, Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, so it'd be a 12,000. To answer the question, uh, somebody asked um, how fast are those stars orbiting? Uh, kind of gentleman, uh, uh, 12,000 kilometers per second, a uh, 4% of the speed of light. Thank you. Uh, yes, the handsome gentleman with the beard and the hat in the back. So the next image won't come until space uh, COBI is. Yes, I will give you my number. Sorry, um, <laughs> sorry. What, what, what did you say? The next image won't come until Space Field Eyes Commission. No. So, um, uh, <laughs> actually, the next image is coming very soon. <laughs> we have 2018 data. Um, I can't tell you more details because I'll be fired from a cannon into the sun. Um, but uh, any Futurama fans? No. Damn. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, we're we're coming out with a new image very soon. It won't be anything too crazy because the array in 2018 looks very similar to the way it did in 2017. But it will be a new image, and we'll keep producing these as we collect more data. As we improve our resolution, we'll get better images of black holes. So more stuff is coming down the pipeline. It's not just we have to wait. You know, yeah, I love you too. It's not just we have to wait. You know, 20 years for the next image or anything. You guys can keep an eye on the news. It'll be coming real soon. And I, real soon, I mean, like, you know, next couple of years. <laughs> it's soon for space, okay? <laughs> One last question. Sure. As vast and as populated by stars as our universe is, we're billions short of them because they're inside that sucker, aren't they? Yeah, that's a fair, yeah, a lot of stars get smaller. Is our galaxy getting smaller? Um, so sucking up and all those fast ones around it are going to be in there. Uh, not exactly, not quite, for the same reason that the Earth isn't going to like uh, spiral into the sun. Like we're in pretty stable orbits because we can't lose angular momentum very easily. And most of the solar system in the galaxy won't either for very, 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 very long periods of time. So it's uh, unlikely that, uh, it's unlikely that like on a, any, any universe, you know, Hubble time scale that uh, things will collapse into. Uh, yeah. yeah.
Let's say there's enough gas and dust out there to make new stars. Yeah. Any other questions before we? Hey. Yeah, sure. Why is there a black hole in the center of our universe? And is there one? Every galaxy? Ooh, yes, it's a really good question. Um, so, uh, like, we found black holes at the center of almost every single galaxy we've seen. So, it does seem to be some mechanism that creates them. We've even observed other galaxies that are in the process of like colliding and fusing their black holes into bigger and bigger black holes. And we know black holes can collide. We see it happen in real time with LIGO. Um, as a question of like why, I don't, I, I don't know like like why there's a consequence of physics. Um, and as, a, as as for the question of you know is there one at the center of every single one? Almost every single one that we found, except for I think the early, very, very earliest proto galaxies, there's a supermassive black hole in, in all of them. Wow. Uh, there's a question in the back I saw too. Yeah. Yeah, um, just a curiosity. How, 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 how uh, <laughs> um, the interaction between um, dark matter and black holes has that been? Do you know anything about the interaction? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, so so for, for dark matter and black holes, they're pretty unrelated concepts. Um, like dark matter is like we, we just have very little idea of what it is. Um, and but like if they're in a black hole, if they're in the vicinity of a black hole, it'll probably get sucked into. They, I, I can there are papers that I can point towards that have done like you know some try to do some analytical work on how uh, theoretical like light dark matter would. Uh, um, would respond in the presence of a black hole. And we have a light dark matter expert in the audience today, actually. You want to stand up, Liam? If you have any questions about dark matter and stuff. Um, okay, yeah, there he is, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so you can ask him for dark matter specific questions. Um, so uh, Ronnie also asked about like dark energy, for example. There was a new paper that came out very recently uh, saying that like black holes might be a source of dark energy. Um, I have my doubts. Uh, there does seem to be an interesting coupling mechanism between the size of black holes and the size of the universe, which could be explained by dark energy. Um, but uh, there's a lot of problems with that. So I don't think dark black holes are a source of dark energy. And I know that was a little bit beyond your question, but yeah. Any other questions? Oh, sure. This is more of a statement that should we think first the black hole or the galaxy? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I think I would, I would say the galaxy because um, we see like very early proto galaxies that don't necessarily have supermassive black holes in them. Um, and all these galaxies came from, you know, primordial fluctuations in, in the matter, matter uh, energy density of the universe, and that does not require a black hole. Uh, so I, I'd say, I'd say the galaxy, if I had to, if I had to, don't quote me on that, but if I, had to, um, I saw a question back there. Yeah. Um, so I know that uh, black holes are is it possible that a neutron star could orbit a black hole? Ooh, that is a, yeah, that is a terrific question. That is an entire field of study uh, right there, that question you had. Um, that was a really good question. Yes, so um, uh, for those of you that here that know about LIGO, uh, LIGO is Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, different kind of interferometry. Um, but uh, they, measure, they measure the collisions of very gravitationally strong objects uh, spiraling in and colliding with each other. So if you have a neutron star in the vicinity of a black hole, they will begin to orbit each other and spiral in for a faster and faster until they eventually collide and form one big black hole. Um, so I, I think there's probably, there's almost certainly like distances at which a neutron star could you know, orbit a black hole safely, but uh, it would be very big distances. You get them too close and they will annihilate and that's what we detect with LIGO. And that's what the LCO follows up with. Then when, it, when, it, when that happens, it produces a huge you know, explosion in the sky and the Las Cumbres Observatory um, turns on all of its telescopes to uh, uh, try to find that uh, that event. Another question. Sure. Yeah. By the way, I have a sorry. I have a projector light like blasting into my face. So if I if, if you can't if I'm not like seeing, you, just shout out. Yeah. Considering the four billion solar masses brought to your next horizon in order to get seen here, wouldn't black holes be brighter earlier in time? Oh, you know that's an interesting that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I don't think so. So the, the brightness that we see from like this, for example, uh, it, it kind of depends on what you mean by brightness. So like, yes, uh, a, a, something getting disrupted or like getting sucked into a black hole produces a huge explosion of energy and that does brighten it. That's like a, a black hole flare. Um, but at the same time, like uh, part of what makes this stuff glow is the fact that it's getting sucked into the black hole's gravity that causes it to superheat and glow. Um, and so the bigger the black hole, the more extreme that effect will be and so the brighter it will glow. 
So you're right in saying that as it as the material crosses or, or you know or uh, accretes and then uh, gets sucked in and some of it gets ejected, uh, that will make it glow very bright. But uh, that'll be more temporary. It won't like it. It won't, it won't like be like it starts out very bright and then gets dimmer over time. I think over time, on average, the black hole will will get brighter. Uh, yeah, that's a really tough question. I'm actually not totally sure about that. I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm kind of spitballing here. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. The uh, the object or the black hole? Uh, oh, um, well, not quite. Uh, so, for example, like when a star is orbiting near a black hole, it will get like tidally disrupted, and like stuff will start getting sucked off of the star, so it'll develop like a very long tail. Um, or, or you know, if you have like an orbiting gas cloud, that'll get like that'll get like blown to the winds, and some of it will get sucked in. If it does get sucked in, um, it shouldn't disappear from the perspective of the observer from a special relativity standpoint. As it gets closer to the black hole, it should appear to get slower and slower and slower until it appears to stop at the event horizon. Um, that's if you could see it, which you wouldn't be able to because the photons coming out of it would get sucked in too. Um, so uh, it's like a lot of weird stuff happens in the black hole, but you're probably like what you're imagining getting like sucked in, that would be that would be from the perspective of the of the of the of the thing getting sucked in. It's a lot more complicated for the for an observer standing outside. That's a really interesting question though. I mean, in, in a kind of a weird way, these images are answering that question too. It's like, what what happens when matter gets sucked in? Well, it throws off photons in this weird pattern. What happens if we get sucked in? <laughs> well, yeah. you're spaghettification. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've never heard of spaghettification? God, that sounds like you're thinking about <laughs> Making me hungry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we got a question. Yeah, uh, you say that the uh, uh, light or the, the, the suck in the velocity with which it goes into the black hole goes down and down and down from our perspective. Does that mean the light coming off of it is more and more redshifted? Uh, yeah, so uh, redshift will occur in redshift does occur in a, in a gravitation in a very strong gravity environment. So the light will get more and more redshifted as it's uh, falling into the black hole. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good insight. Yeah. Is that right? that, um, general relativity and quantum mechanics don't provide you the same answer. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that you've got a sort of a Schrodinger's cat situation where it was right and wrong at the same time, or was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it could be. Um, the, the problem with the two answers, I didn't go too much into it. Well, actually, I yelled a lot about it, but uh, the, the problem with the two answers is that like from a very like broad perspective, they're both nonsense. Like one's a zero and one's an infinity <laughs> and neither of them, that makes any sense. And it doesn't give you any information about what's happening inside. So um, if they're both correct, that would be horrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it could be that. I honestly, I am not, uh, I am, uh, there are very few people that are qualified enough to speak directly to that, and I am <laughs> definitely not one of them. <laughs> that is a very, that is a very, that's the question. That that's the question, though, right? So, yeah. Uh, that's kind of embarrassing. I'm going to talk about that. I was hard. Before we say goodbye, let's give him another hand. <laughs> So, hey, one more way. Come here. Are still on? Does our news channel reporter want to say anything or ask a question? John? Uh, it'll take me a trillion years to come up with a question. <laughs> it's okay. We should have one or two new images by then. Yeah. Well, <laughs> your video guy's hidden somewhere. He's good. We're going to be on the news, aren't we? All of us here, I would think. You did good. Thank you, sir. Joseph Farah, grad you, sir. student, UCSD. <laughs> They allow you to take a check? I don't, am I allowed to? Oh, thank you. Well, of course. Oh, my God. Thank you. It's our $100 honorarium. I appreciate the it. Professors won't take it. Thank you. This it is like breaks our heart. We get to keep the money. Also, <laughs> uh, we had a rare uh, priceless porcelain cup uh, dug up from the Indian burial grounds of the Chumash out by the That's creek. Cool. And, and I left it somewhere. <laughs> and it was given to me by merchandise manager. I hope she picks it up again. It's hard to carry that sucker around. Do you still have it? Because we'd like, okay, we'll find it unless somebody's got a free one. They're $10, but they're. <laughs>
We've got the official <laughs> cup. We've got another professor from UCSB talking to us on June 4th, right here in this very room. You want to learn more about us? Join our club, SBAU, right next to my name, .org. And Monday mornings, 11 to noon, we get on the screen with Zoom. Thank it's you. called the SBAU Astro Hour. We're going to be talking about this. So thank you. Thank you, you got so the cup, all right? I did, yeah. Here's thank our president. You. Let's have a hand for our president, Jerry Wilson. I'm happy to talk to anyone too who has more questions and stuff. But. Thank you. No, that was so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Right. You guys, just a brief question. Did you guys all laugh at my 